Hi, Julia. What have you been reading this week? Hey, Laura. Um, so my first piece this week actually isn't an article, but it's a podcast. Um, it's an episode of The Daily, which is a podcast by The New York Times. And it was broadcast, I think, on Monday. I want to say, yeah, Monday the 4th. And the story this particular podcast tells is that of Ashut Deng. Ashut is a Sudanese refugee in the US who works at a Smithfield pork factory in South Dakota. We talked quite a bit last week about the crisis the meat industry finds itself in as a result of coronavirus and, and particularly the, the difficult situation that industry is in in the US. But I just felt I had to return to that subject again this week because when I listened to the podcast on Monday, it made such an impression on me. I just um, I had to share it with you. Now, if you are in um, the food industry or you read a lot about the food industry, the podcast isn't really going to tell you anything you didn't know about the sort of facts and figures about the difficulties that, that meat processors are facing in the US right now. What it does do really effectively is put a human face to that crisis. So very briefly, Ashut is, is a mother of two. Um, and they, her family, of course, relies on her to bring in wages from her job at Smithfield. And she also supports other people um, back in Sudan. She has a tough job on the production line. Um, they are not pussyfooting around the fact that um, this is tough physical, physical labor and it takes its toll. But it's a job she appreciates for what it does for her family. You know, it pays a decent wage. There's health insurance. It's a springboard, if you will, into a better life for her and, and her family. And then she gets sick. She gets COVID-19. And that sickness, coupled with what's happening in the meat industry at large, the quarantine and lockdown restrictions that are, that are being imposed, and the executive order by Donald Trump declaring meat an essential industry, all of that comes together to create a domino effect on a sheet's life and the life of her family. And what the podcast tells so effectively, and, and why I just had to pick it for, for our conversation this week, is uh, within a matter of weeks, days, actually, this situation, this perfect storm moves a woman who has fought so hard for a better life, who's done all the right things, who wants all the right things, who's working incredibly hard and takes real pride in what she does from a point where she is building that better life for herself and her family to where she is on the verge of losing everything she's worked for. Um, you just have to listen to it. That's um, that's all I can say. It's um, it's beautifully told, um, really effective and, and emotional. And Ashut herself is is really eloquent and, and a, just a very engaging person to to listen to. And I thought it was such an important reminder of the, I guess, the human stories behind all the different headlines um, that that we're seeing at the moment. What did you make of it when you when yeah. you listened to it? You, you shared it with shared it with me earlier this week, and it was so interesting to hear about the meat industry through the lens of an employee in a so honest way. Because normally we don't really hear that, and it was uh, just so moving as well about the the pressure that she put on herself just to work her forty hours a week at Smithfield, and then the the um, overtime on top, as you say, to send that that, that money back home. Um, and what I really liked about it as well was the, the way it was edited that you know she had to go and look after a kid look at the, one of her kids called her during the middle of the interview and you know different things happened and that wasn't edited out so it was all just a slick clean interview it was quite raw and ready so you understood her more and you felt like you understood her life so yeah I, I would agree with you it's a must listen it puts a different dynamic on the meat industry and shows I guess how important it is for people's lives but you know how the strain it took on her body as well um over time as she moved through different roles in in that factory absolutely what i really appreciated about the way the podcast was edited as well and and i'd completely echo your comments about how it was nice to not have a super slick interview but but something that really gave a sense of where she was and and, and how her sort of family life fit in fits in with that i also really appreciated the fact that um 
you know, as I said, the po- the podcast editors didn't shy away from um, being quite frank about the, the fact that this is tough physical labor, yeah. labor, and it, it takes its toll on on workers. And you know, we all know that the meat industry certain you know in certain parts of the meat industry do have um challenges when it comes to uh, worker safety in the, in the current environment as well so there's no suggestion that it's sort of all sunshine and lollipops but we also did hear um a shoot talk about what that job gives her and the yeah. opportunities it gives her family and i just loved hearing about how proud she is to yeah. um, play a part in providing safe food for, for other families. Um, I thought the balance um, was, was struck just right. Um, yeah. I've definitely not heard an interview like that before. So uh, and I would have never found it unless you had sent it to me. So uh, yeah, as I said to you, I was ready for a glass of gin after, but I really enjoyed it. Yes, it's a, it's a tough listen, but, um, yeah. but really, uh, really worth listening to. What have, yeah. you been, um, what have you been reading this week? Yeah, and um, it's hard to pick out three, isn't it, uh, you know, from the amount of, the, of things that we see. But the, the first article that I want to pick up on this week was uh, something that I saw in the Wall Street Journal. And this was an article entitled, You've Got Mail, The Pandem- Pandemic is Jamming Up the World's Post. Um, and this is all around uh, freight and the fact that um, so much of our freight is on passenger planes and that the fact that thousands and thousands of planes and flights of um, cancellations have happened, it's really affecting air cargo. And something that I hadn't really thought about, t- to be honest. So um, historically, flight is saying in the article, flies essentially subsidise the cost of many air shipments and carriers devoted roughly a third of their cargo space to letters, packages, commercial goods according to to industry Um, and it talks quite a lot in the article about how that's impacted postal services US Post in particular is now uh, using um, uh, sea freight to ship to to the EU which is interesting Uh, but more so food as well Um, and I was really pleased actually I read the article and then spotted a quote from someone I know um, Darlene um, who Darlene Ray who's MD of OB Organic which is um, a, a, a company actually I've been to see uh, lucky enough to in, in Australia uh, and her company ship a lot of beef into the US and they normally do that by plane uh, and she's saying that in Australia 80 to 85 percent of our air cargo normally leaves um, the country on passenger flights uh, but now uh, there's no room to be able to book that so in normal times she's saying grass-fed beef would normally use air freight to send chilled premium beef overseas now using uh, sea freight for fur- frozen which is taking 30 days rather than five um and she said we just have to do more and try and adapt to the situation so the impact of you know air travel which naively i thought yeah that, that in, it affects us as individuals but for perishable food products that's hugely impactful and the fact that even um, the food industry can't get a, a price that's going to last more than 24 hours there's a great quote in the article saying you know you used to be able to get a quote and that quote would last you 30 days now every 24 hours the price is going up and up and up and if you're producing perishable food that you're used to getting a, probably a premium for sending around the world, you, you really, you, you're looking at sea options and, you know, what's that going to do to your shelf life? What, what did you think? Did, did, did you know all of that already? Because I was quite surprised by some of that. I, I didn't. And I, I thought the, the article was really interesting um, precisely because it sort of sheds a light on, um, yeah, I think a part of the supply chain that, we often don't think about, you know, I, I often think when you, when you write about a food in particular, you know, there's so many, um, visible parts of the supply chain that are there to be written about to be analyzed something like logistics and supply chain mm. uh, can be quite easily overlooked so i really appreciated the article for sort of shedding a a, a, a light on um as you say that sort of unintended consequence of, of reduced um passenger flights inevitably because this is a, a an article about um what's happening with freight more generally. Um, I read the, the bit about, um, you know, your, your beef contact there and it immediately made me think, oh, I wish they would just asked her a bit more and included a few more quotes because she talks about having to be more agile and adapt. Yeah. And you kind of think, 
I just, I'd love to know, what are you actually doing? Like, how do you cope with the impact that's having on, on shelf life? It sparked lots of questions for me that I, I, I wanted to sort of go into in, in some more detail. But um, yeah, really, really interesting, um, interesting article. Yeah. What's your second pick of the week? So my second pick, um, I guess we're sort of talking about working conditions again. Um, this is a piece from Anthropocene a magazine. Anthropocene is a publication that um, writes a lot about um, the environment, climate change, sustainability, and so forth. Um, the article um, it itself is about some new research that's been done into the impact of the climate crisis on agriculture. What's really interesting about this um, new piece of research is that it isn't looking at the impact on crops, but on agricultural workers. So much of the debate is about um, what happens to you know, such and such a crop or such and such a varietal when temperatures rise. But this is asking what's going to happen to working conditions when the weather is much drier and, um, and much hotter than it is today. Um, the findings, as you would expect, um, are reasonably alarming. Um, and the sort of standout uh, stat, I guess, for me was that if temperatures rise by two degrees, this is one of the, the modelling um, sort of versions they've done, the average agricultural worker in the US, so this is a piece focused on the US, um, will on average experience 39 days of unsafe heat every year. And there are certain parts of the US that they reckon um, could be potentially considered unsafe for the entire growing season if working practices stay as they are today. And I, I suppose that's the sort of important caveat here. There's absolutely no reason to suggest that working practices would simply stay as they are and that they wouldn't adapt to um, to, to climate change. Um, and there's talk in the article of, of potentially slightly different p versions of PPE, you know, lighter, cooler fabrics, that sort of thing to help mitigate the impact of, of, um, of higher temperatures. So, we're not necessarily looking at a situation where um, this is something that can't be managed, but I suppose the, the point of the research really is to highlight that this is yet another facet of the climate crisis that we need to be looking at, that you know, changes in, in, our, in our climate are going to affect not just what we grow and where, but also how we look after those crops and, and how we can safely harvest them um, once they're grown. What did you make of it? Yeah, I've never seen an article like that before. Really unique in terms of putting the, the labour at the heart of, um, of the question and, and the death, some of the death rates that it spelled out due to heat, heat exhaustion were just phenomenal. Again, it's something that I don't think we talk about enough, maybe because that's, we're living in a more temperate climate over here than the US. But, um, you know, it... It's a bit like you were saying about the earlier article. The next step for me is what? What's next? Is it more automation? What, what's you know what's going to happen to our industry as labour does become shorter and shorter, and we want to use less? And because of these, uh, you know, extenuating factors like heat, uh, but yeah, really impactful. Yeah, totally. And as you say, um, it does make you think about p potential solutions, solutions, which I suppose is is the whole point of um, of doing research into this. It's just I, I found it a, a very useful reminder that um, you know when we talk about the climate crisis, um, it really touches on every aspect of of how we grow and yeah. produce food. Yeah. What's your second pick? Um, the second pick of mine was in The Guardian and I really enjoyed this but again that's because I'm just quite obsessive about food related things uh, and this was an article called How Tesco's Doomsday Exercise Helped It Cope With Coronavirus um, and this uh, and I, I do like any articles like this that uh, a CEO lets you see behind the curtain because probably because they're quite few and far between and we sometimes don't get the, the, the level of the uh, insight and the internal workings particularly with with some of the major multiple retailers. But this is an interview with Dave Lewis, CEO of Tesco, 
talking about um, this doomsday exercise he ran four years ago for, for Tesco. And he said uh, people thought it was uh, a bit ridiculous and extreme. Uh, and this was based out of their uh, Welling Garden City HQ, um, looking about what would happen if there was something like a pandemic or doom, doomsday, uh, and resulted in a lot of the teams um, making sure they had the right kit in terms of uh, computers, uh, technology in terms of Zoom, and apparently a lot of the teams have been using Zoom for the, the last two years, some of the big team meetings of over 100 people um, and I, so I, I found that really in, interesting because I guess I've been in um, that situation historically where you've been in an organisation that have said let's let's run this exercise and probably been in the same boat as some of Dave's reports there thinking oh this is the last thing we need we've got a list of all this stuff to do but fair, fair play to have that that foresight um, I also saw an article with him a couple of weeks ago where he was saying, you know, we've changed more in Tesco in the um, last four weeks than we have in the last 10 years. So that, that agility and, and, and pivoting. But finally, in the Guardian article, he, he moved on to talk about what they've done in terms of online and delivery. Uh, and they're now up to 1.2 uh, million delivery slots a week pushing to, to 1.5. But what makes that quite unique for them, unlike Ocado, is they're still hand-picking all those orders. And on one day, they'd, um, they'd picked over 10 million items, uh, which he, he believes is a UK record. And, you know, they the flex their opening hours so they can do all the picking, or a lot more picking overnight. And um, just hugely interesting, you know, how a, a giant like that, I've, I've biggest supermarket in the country had had the foresight to plan and is now you know stepping up to the up to, up to the plate to deliver and you know um worth reminding he's leaving the business in october and uh, a big change for them what what did you think do you often see behind the curtain like that particularly in your your old gig at the grocer i think you get opportunities to do that but but as you say I think particularly with those um, you know the, the big CEOs of, of the big retailers those moments are few and far between which mm -hmm. is why they are so valuable and I, I agree when I saw that piece and I think Sarah Butler um, at The Guardian who wrote it um, I thought it was a real coup to be to be yeah. given that kind of insight I mean I'm sure when he leaves in October he's going to have no shortage of offers um, <laughs> and, and articles like this um, yeah you know, we're not really I think I think Dave's going to be all right, um, but you know articles like that, that sort of talk about having um, amazing foresight and um, acting. I, I think uh, much more swiftly than than our own government perhaps um, will certainly help with that. But I thought it was really interesting, and I think what you said about um, you know the difficulties with these sorts of with, with that sort of scenario planning is that if the worst doesn't happen, no one really thanks you for having had the foresight and having planned yeah. for that. But when you do run into a crisis um, like the one we have at the moment, that level of preparation can can well make the difference between um, whether, you know, you, you, you thrive or, or, you know, struggle to survive in a crisis like this. So, yeah. It does. It did make me wonder, actually. You know, obviously, everyone's now thinking about a, a pandemic. Um, I do wonder whether that sort of those sort of lessons will translate into other scenarios that might require a similar level of foresight and planning. And we've just talked about the climate crisis, and that's a sort of it's a sort of obvious example, isn't yeah. it? Um, I think it'll be interesting to see whether it will prompt all sorts of businesses in the, in the food industry to um, apply a similar kind of level of preparation and rigour to um, dealing with the, the coming climate crisis as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, what's your third pick? So my third and final pick is from The Economist um, and it's about Corona the beer in the time of coronavirus, um, which really tells you what this article is about. Um, the, the question it asks essentially is, um, what do you do if you have a brand, a big brand, a successful brand, a brand with a rich history, and now your brand name makes everyone think of death and destruction rather than um, exotic beaches and limes and fun in the sun? Uh, what do you do? Does this matter? Do you just sit that out and hope it goes away? Should you change the name? Do you acknowledge that there's, um, you know, uh, an association there? 
Um, and it's a really interesting piece um, that sort of um, explores the history of, of, of the Corona brand more generally as well um, and, and its importance to the Mexican economy and so on and so forth. But um, on that core question of what do you do with a, a brand name like that, um, the marketing experts um, and the sort of branding experts they've interviewed seem to come down largely on the side of don't acknowledge the association because you're just going to reinforce it um, and don't change the name because there's just so much provenance and history tied up in the name that, you know, what do you have left of your brand if you potentially let, let go of that? Um, they do, however, suggest one possible solution, which I thought was really interesting, um, a potential rebrand to Coronita which is apparently what Corona is called in Spain because of some trademark issue, um, which I thought was a, was a really interesting suggestion, something that sort of, I suppose, gets you away from using the word Corona, but still retains an obvious enough link to the original brand that people sort of um, understand that they're connected and, and you don't lose all of that provenance and, and heritage. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to see whether AB InBev, the, the brand owner of, um, of Corona, decide to, to ultimately go down that route. But um, yeah, really sort of interesting article that just, you know, takes a deep dive into what's a quite tricky um conundrum to be facing for a brand right now it's not it's not what you want what did you think of it yeah and I, I liked it I agree I thought the compromise at the end was probably a good idea uh, and it was interesting that the, it was saying in there that there'd been radio silence from their marketing team since the middle of March uh, and you know you you've always told me room 101 is you've got to communicate and to to ignore that association it's, it's, it's a pretty big, brave move to, to take uh, rather than, I don't, I don't know, to talk to your audiences. So uh, I, I liked where the, the article went. I was very interested to see sort of their, their corporate affairs face had, had gone very quiet. I suppose if you're in that situation, um, it's very difficult to communicate. Uh, I mean, I, I worked on a piece um, a, a few weeks ago looking at um, communication strategies in that sort of very early phase of, of the coronavirus outbreak and what different FMCG brands were doing around that. And the feedback I got at the time was, you know, if you don't have anything to say, um, then it, you probably don't say anything. Um, and sometimes I think that can be the safer option. Yeah. But if you do decide to communicate, then you can't pretend that what's happening isn't happening. And I suppose if you are a brand that has a really potentially quite tricky issue to navigate um, in a, uh, at a moment like this, I could see how you might say, well, maybe staying out of this completely is um yeah. is the best option here because if we do say something then we have to really start to engage on this issue and it's not really going to benefit our brand necessarily yeah. what's the um what's the final piece you've picked my final piece is uh, out of the grocer uh, and it's uh, written by a friend of ours karina perkins at, at the grocer um and this is called will coronavirus scupper progress on single-use plastic and this is something that's interested me um as a, as a bystander really seeing um, uh, my mum and dad, for example, getting an online delivery and that's no longer delivered um, in crates, it's delivered in plastic bags again and you, we're seeing you know, more and more people that want things packaged because loose could carry coronavirus and all the rest of it. Um, and Karina's piece talks about DEFRA's decision to delay the UK ban on plastic straws, stirrers and cotton buds till at least October this year. So, so they've pushed it back. Um, she then, she's interviewed a, a few of the, the key movers and shakers in, in, in this sector. And it's really interested me that the, the plastic um, sector is struggling because of the... Um, the equation it talks about that the business model depends on the value of the end material being higher than the cost of collection and processing, which 
you know, <laughs> it goes without saying, but I've never really thought about it before. Um, but unfortunately, they're, they're struggling to make that uh, equation balance. And that's partly down to the fact that all the lighter packaging material is less profitable to recycle. And then in addition to that, at the moment, um, the big commercial outlets aren't um, recycling. So, you know, your, your pubs, your restaurants, all this cardboard and all the rest of it um, isn't being collected and, and, and plastic. Um, but what we're also seeing is the tie in price between oil and plastic and the fact that oil equals plastic and the fact that oil is so cheap at the moment single-use plastic is so cheap so people aren't recycling and it's costing the industry a lot so there's a there's a, a great quote in here that says um, both paper and plastics are now in very short supply um, but the impact on price of oil falling through the floor uh, has kept the, uh, the plastic price down but on cardboard in contrast prices have increased tenfold so I guess the big question is, you know, as consumers, and we touched on sustainability in, in a different way earlier, does that, is plastic going to matter to us for the next 18 months, two years, or are we all actually going to take a pause on this and think, do you know what, I just want to make sure that it, it's free from contamination when the, that this food product enters my house? Well, what were your thoughts um, I, I thought it was a great article, um, precisely for the for the reasons that you highlighted. And I, I suppose it's really that link to crude oil prices that I think is, is particularly interesting. I think there's been a lot of um, coverage around how um, single use plastic has sort of crept into, um, in, into the market um, a bit more again as a result of the crisis. But I think it's that link between um, post-consumer plastic or sort of recycled plastic and the oil price um, that I think is is really important to consider in all of this that you know as with everything um, the economic incentives need to be aligned and face in in the right direction if you want um, industries if you want people to be to be making um, the right decisions from a sustainability point of view and obviously what's happened with the the crash in oil prices has made that economic case much more challenging um, than it than it was before for. It also just reminded me that um, I think on that whole debate around um, hygiene and, and using uh, single use plastic to um, sort of assure people about um, about food hygiene that you know there's such a gulf isn't there between what people might perceive to be more hygienic and safer and and, and what the actual risk profile might be around yeah. using you know recycled um, plastics or, or reusing packaging but um, I suppose it is particularly in the early stages of something as terrifying as a pandemic like this people aren't going to be um, are, they're not going to be willing to take any risks, understandably. No. And the idea that you can take a piece of single-use plastic and it can be disposed after use, I think, probably plays an important role in reassuring people. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that, that, that you know, something like single-use plastic can can have a really positive yeah. role in in a scenario like that. Now that we're sort of, you know, um, starting perhaps to to you know see the light at the end of the tunnel, I wonder whether it will be easier to take a more nuanced view on this and to, yeah. Um, yeah not just have that sort of knee-jerk reaction that says, well, I need stuff that I can throw away after single use because that makes me feel safe and it makes me yeah. feel like everything's hygienic, but to perhaps, um, yeah, get, get that nuance across a little bit more. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Great that talking to you as ever. Loved it. And looking forward you to catching too. with you next week. All right. Bye. Take care, Laura. Bye. Bye.